Hello and welcome to What Should I Think About? I'm Stephen. Uh, Celine's away today, um, but I'm very, very happy to welcome Dr. Heather Ransom on the podcast today. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. So, um, Dr. Heather Ransom is uh, an ex-Jehovah's Witness and she's going to tell us her story, but she's also an academic. She's written two papers. We're going to talk about those as well. Um, so we've got lots to talk about. Let's um, let's perhaps start with your story, please, Heather. Um, why, obviously, you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness. I guess that's the reason you're really interested in it. Tell us a bit about your, mm -hmm. your background. Um, yeah, sure. So I was born um, into the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, my mum was a doorstep convert. She was one of those perfect, you know, examples of, of how to bring somebody into the truth, so to speak. <laughs> um, so I was raised in, in the religion along with my brother and sister. Um, and I, my mum was quite staunch, actually, quite, mm. you know, quite a feisty character. <laughs> um, and she certainly instilled it in us to, to the extent that I completely believed that it was the truth spent most of my life like pioneering and raising my children um, in the witnesses. Um, however, my dad was never a Jehovah's Witness. And so it was, um, it, it could be at times very distressing. And, and I, I do think about this in my research for children, when they've got that, those opposing views of the paradise is coming, you're going to have your own panda and your own tiger, and you know, live, live at the park, so to speak. Um, but on the other hand, uh, because my dad wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, never has been, I, you know. Mm. I was also told that he was going to die at Armageddon. And that's a really distressing thing for a child. Um, mm. And it used to give me nightmares. Um, and it is something that I, I definitely want to include in, in future research that I do. Um, so, yeah, that was my life. Spent most of the time pioneering, raising children, working very menial jobs, cleaning jobs, mm. mostly, um, because that's what JW women do. We have yep. to be in our place. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in my 40s, uh, I had a series of events in my life that made me start to question it. So the first was my sister. Um, she left the religion. Um, wasn't disfellowshipped. However, because I was a regular pioneer at the time, I was encouraged, as they like to use the word encouraged, <laughs> to, to shun her obviously, um, which I found very, very difficult. So I would say that I probably semi-shunned her. I couldn't do it 100%, mm. which, of course, gave me guilt because I wasn't doing it Jehovah's Way. And mm. you know what it's like. They tell you that the more you shun, the more likely they are to come yes. back. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that was very difficult. Then my friend, my, my closest friend, actually, was disfellowshipped. So, of course, it was a massive no-no that I couldn't speak to her. Mm. Again, I really, really struggled with that because her son and my son were best friends. So um, we would still be in touch to arrange, you know, children's play things. Um, and inevitably, because we'd been best friends, we'd end up chatting and then I'd have the guilt associated with talking to a disfellowship person. Yeah. And then one day it finally hit me. Um okay, so what happens if one of my children leaves the religion or if one of my children gets disfellowshipped? Mm. And I knew that I would not be able to shun them. Sorry, but mm. that's, that's crossing a line. So it was for that reason um, and other reasons that were going on in my life um, within my family that exposed a lot of hypocrisy that really went against everything I believed in the religion but also everything that I believe morally anyway. Um, so it was kind of like a series of events. And I remember making the, making the decision, I think it was 2015. Um, I was on the ministry um, and I was just walking door to door. And I said to myself, I'm never doing this again. That's it. I'm done. I'm never doing this again. And I didn't. And they were asking me to go on the cart and all sorts of stuff. Quite proud to say I've never been on the cart. Um <laughs> <laughs> six months later um i made the decision to stop going to the meetings and this was because um i was getting to the stage where i was having a, quite a few panic attacks on the way to the hall getting ready for the meeting and um, my stomach would go over i'd feel ill mm. driving to the hall i'd feel ill and when i was in there i just could not wait to get out and i thought if i don't leave this religion or at least stop going to the hall i'm going to be one of those Jehovah's Witnesses that has weird things wrong with them because I don't know if you've noticed a lot of mm. a lot of JWs seem to have very strange autoimmune illnesses. Mm. 
Um, so yeah, I decided to to stop going. Um, never looked back. I think for about six months, I had elders knocking on my door every single Saturday morning. Wow. So every Saturday morning, the curtains were all shut. I was a bit of a recluse maybe for a couple of years. Um, and then I decided to go to university and that changed my life completely. So I decided to go to university because I had to understand the processes involved in religion and how they could control your life so, you know, mm. so completely. Um, I obviously re-established friendships with people who've been disfellowshipped in the past, um, re-established a better relationship with my sister, did a lot of apologising to people that I'd mm. had to, been forced to shun in the past, you know. Yep, yep. And from then it was just like a, I suppose, a learning process. So I decided to do my um, dissertation, my year three dissertation at uni on leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so that is actually the study you were talking about before. Uh, right. So we, um, after I'd finished the, um, after I'd got my degree, um, my supervisors and I decided we want to try and get that published. And because there's so little research mm -hmm. in the area of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and the way we did it was, hadn't been done that way before. So it was a mixture of disfellowship yep. people and not disfellowship people. So yeah, I did that. I got my degree, applied for a master's, ended up doing a PhD. And that was because where I was in my life, um, I knew I couldn't let go of it. <laughs> there was there's so little information out there, so few studies that I thought, no, I've got to, I've got to carry on with this. So um, yeah, ended up doing a PhD. So what, one good thing about leaving was that, um, obviously I said before I'd raised all my children in it. So on the way home from the hall, on that very last meeting I went to, I said to my boys who were in the car with me, and my daughter was married at this point, um, I just need to tell you that that is the last meeting that I'm ever going to. I, I, I cannot right. go anymore. I don't want to go anymore. I was fully expecting them to say, well, you know what we need to do. <laughs> um, but both of them said, we don't want to go anymore either. Well. So I was in the very, very fortunate position of when I left the Jehovah's Witnesses that I had support. And I think mm. support is very important. And I think a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, especially disfellowship ones, mm. don't have support. And I think that leads to a lot of the mental health problems that um, that comes across there. So my sons have obviously left. Um, my youngest son, who's 15 now, is... Of, of the lot of us is going to have the most normal life as possible because mm -hmm. he, you know, I took him out when he was seven. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to have that whole mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. And my other son's at uh, university. He's about to get his PhD. And my other son's in America. He married uh, an American girl, not a Jehovah's Witness. So he had a mm -hmm. lucky escape there as well. <laughs> yeah, it's all worked Fantastic. out pretty well, actually. Great. Well, that's, um, that's quite a journey. Um, so, uh, so I hope you don't mind. So, age-wise, how old were you uh, when you decided that uh, this was no longer for you? How old were you when you when you made that decision? I think I was forty-eight. Forty-eight. So, um, up until then, you'd obviously you you said you were quite a devout Jehovah's Witness. You pioneered. You you did all that. So, did you believe all the doctrines? Did you? Um, Absolutely. You, you believed all that stuff. Absolutely. 100%. I was one of those that always did my watchtower, studied it up like crazy, yep. always did the Bible reading, did the Bible highlights, always answered up in the Bible highlights, um, which was probably a bit of a clue that I might go on to do a bit of studying. Yeah. Um, because the amount of studying that you can do in the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, I, I did that. Yeah, I was yeah. quite involved. Always yeah. on the platform doing demos. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is quite, uh, I've talked about this before on the podcast, it's quite an odd, <laughs> it's odd for lots of reasons, but one of the odd things about Jehovah's Witnesses is, um, on the one hand, it's, it's obviously it's a religion, it's supposed to be about spirituality and about all these ethereal things, but actually I think it's, it's very analytical. Um, it's not like when you go to a, like an evangelical meeting or something and everybody's mm -hmm. praising the Lord and they're all happy and, you know, it's a, actually a very quite an austere you're going to a, a, essentially these are classes aren't they that you sit there and you you read texts and you talk about these texts and you answer about these texts and it, it's very analytical i mean obviously it's very restricted 
um, in terms of what you are allowed to read and what what you're allowed to look up but so long as you stay within the confines of the publications mm. by the watchtower then you know you can yeah you can spend all all, all your time studying reading um, and it feels like you're doing something it feels academic almost i think in some respects if you want to you know that, that there is that part of it which is is kind of odd i don't think um people that have never experienced that i don't think they they um, probably realized that it certainly was in my day anyway when i was growing up there was a lot of stuff and um, i hear that it's kind of dumbed down quite quite a bit now yeah, in I terms so. of, of the the material and, and so on but um but yeah I think it is analytical, but on the other hand, it, it's it's within cl very close guarded boundaries, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. what you can you can study the Watchtower and you can answer up, but you can only answer what's in that paragraph. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. not really freedom, is it? It's not, and it's it's an it's an illusion of um, uh, of analysis, really, isn't it? You know. So let's have a look at this paragraph. Uh, yeah, you can cross reference. Uh, scriptures bible texts and so on but it has to again be interpreted by that same channel so it's it's all very mm. very internal yeah um so w when you were leaving did you um you've not mentioned a partner so um was your husband um a witness did you have a husband at this time or, or how did that um that all work out yeah, I was married at the time. Um, my uh, ex-husband now is still a Jehovah's Witness. Right. Um, the, the marriage was never particularly good, but, you know, when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're mm. kind of stuck. Yeah. Uh, Jehovah's Witness woman and man, probably, actually. Mm. Um, so when I left the religion, um, I, I also left the marriage. Right. I wanted a complete break from everything to do w with the religion and the conformity that, you know, that went along with that. Um so yeah. So we, were you just marriage as well. were you disfellowshipped? No. So no, you... I just I just uh, faded. I right. just actually, I always say that there's there's this ways of leaving the the Jehovah's Witnesses. You can you can get kicked out the front door. You can go out the front door and slam it behind you, which is disassociation. Mm. Or you can creep out the back door, which is what I did, fading. I just yeah. kind of went invisible. One thing that did surprise me that I, I was in the same religion, the same congregation, my whole life. And I would say I had quite a wide circle of friends. And yet I can count on one hand the amount of people that, you know, that I thought were friends that just never, ever bothered to find out how I was, what I was doing, you know, why I'd left. It's, it's a really strange, bizarre. It makes you realise that friendships that you do garner in that religion are very contingent on staying in the religion. So they're not yeah. really... They're not true friends, are they? Really? Mm. I think that's something that a lot, a lot of us have have experienced. I mean, one of the things that I found, I don't, know, don't know whether you did the same, but because I didn't want to get disfellowshipped, I was, I was quite keen not to be disfellowshipped. Um, I didn't talk to others about the reasons why I was leaving. So, of course, you do get asked that. So, in a strange way, um, you you almost feel a need to separate yourself yourself as well as as that being done to you you know and so i i didn't do it purposely i didn't say all right i don't want to talk to this lot anymore but i was the more i had interactions with my former friends and brothers and sisters at the hall the more i had interaction with them the more opportunities there were for them to say oh why are you not coming steve um and then at that point you kind of feel like you're you're playing russian roulette because you know if you say if you give the answer then you, you're out there mercy whether they go and tell the elders do you know what Stephen said to me um yeah and yeah. You, you then get labeled as an apostate so you, you end up oh yeah you end up either saying nothing or, or being pretty pathetic you know like well i just don't really I don't know. and that wasn't my that was i didn't feel that i felt really strongly about why i wasn't going but i couldn't say mm -hmm. it so i just separated myself i don't know whether you felt, yeah. found that as well i did yeah and i think as, as, as a jehovah's witness and maybe a jehovah's witness woman as well you're very much taught not to stand up for yourself mm. and yeah. so so the, the best thing to, for me was to remain quiet and then if yeah. you don't ask me any questions, I can't say anything that you don't want to hear. And I remember yeah. I'd started watching various things online um, and people had said, whatever you do, just don't let them arrange a, um, a meeting with you right? because it will probably turn into a judicial thing. Okay. And I knew I hadn't done anything wrong, so they couldn't do 
anything yeah. but you know all they have to do is start asking questions like do you still believe it's the truth mm. and i thought no i i don't want to engage mm. um so every attempt that elders made to get in touch with me i was never rude no. um, i just didn't answer mm. just didn't answer and how long did it take the um so you really believe the doctrines um yeah you you left mainly because of uh, what you were starting to see around you with, with the way people were and so on. How long did it take for those doctrines to start falling apart so you, you stopped believing all of that stuff? Well, this is another important part of my research, I think, because, I, because I was quite, I'm quite a studious person. Uh, yeah. One of the first things I did when I left was uh, bought myself a, a, a lovely <laughs> leather-bound King James Bible. Yes. Um, and me and my son would sit at the table and we would compare... Um, pivotal mm. JW scriptures with mm. those in the King James Bible and along with um, different websites that I found um, where you could compare those um, I made a conscious effort I suppose to unpick the doctrine and it mm. is it's like it's like unpicking a very tightly knit tapestry isn't it you know yeah. getting those getting those little loops out mm. so I spent um, considerable time um, watching YouTube videos of different people um, reading, reading what you'd call the, the normal Bible. I'd probably say it took about six months. And I remember that sudden realization, oh my word, it's actually not the truth. And then <laughs> you enter a period of feeling stupid that you could ever have been duped into believing that for so long mm. when after you've researched it, it's so clearly not the truth. But your your tra your thoughts are trained in such a, a strong powerful way that we're taught to reject anything that's that's disconfirming to to the beliefs aren't we mm, yeah so yeah i'd say it took a few months um and then i went through various phases i was the, the feeling stupid phase and i was the angry phase you know yeah can't believe what you know i've, I've wasted most of my life mm -hmm. um and then the next phase was okay what are you going to do now because you yeah. can't just sit around moping feeling sorry for yourself so i wanted to to get a good job Mm. which of course you can't get without a degree mm. i needed to i wanted to go to uni anyway because i needed to understand the psychological underpinnings of, of, of religion yeah um so yeah it took a few months but i do think a lot of people don't do that you know i think they're so scared and mm. I've, i covered this in my research my phd research that's not published yet okay. they're so scared of being labeled an apostate that they're unwilling to engage in researching the religion researching mm. the beliefs mm. and so they they can tend to go through life with what i call a death row death row mentality that they're yeah. still waiting for armageddon and they're yeah. still waiting to die yeah it's it's pretty horrible actually so i think uh, and my my research confirms this as well that unpicking the doctrine is is pivotal in um trying to restore your mental health and to restore some kind of like identity of, of you mm. as who you are Mm. rather than this cookie cut jw that you've been brought up to be yeah yeah i want to talk about identity in a big way actually um heather because that's one of my particular interests um uh, around this subject i think it's so important especially for born-ins um but let's let's come come back to that um yeah so in terms of the doctrines then you it took you a few months you you sort of went down the the bible route i suppose because i i never basically I decided that um, I wanted to know whether I thought the Bible was true. So that was the research I did. And as soon as I realized I didn't believe the Bible anymore, um, then I didn't need to do all that research, comparative stuff, because I didn't believe it anyway, you know. Um, but you went mm. down the, the sort of comparative route, looking at, at the scriptures and deciding how the doctrines interpreted the bible that's quite an interesting um yeah i don't journey. believe the bible at all now though <laughs> no <laughs> so it's, it's wrong on two fronts really it's um yeah even so, on its own yeah, logic, I unpicked, yeah. yeah we unpicked the jw doctrine first but then yeah. you know on further consideration um <laughs> you know unless i get proof to the alternative um i think that uh the bible is just made up to make people conform i do think there's good, good parts in the bible obviously but yeah. a, a moral person would would be that way anyway you know you shouldn't need the bible to make you be a good person no i totally agree i mean i, I 
talked about that on the podcast uh, many times. I'm a humanist myself, so um, that's that's my view. Um, but I know, I know for some people that leave, it can be um, quite comforting to find another uh, system of, of religious belief, and, and you know that that's perhaps another area of interest. Um, why and how that that works? Yeah, that um, might happen to me in, in years in the future. Sure. But at the moment. Um, not something I would rule out, but at the moment, no, no, thank you. Yeah, I've yeah. had enough. Yes. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. So, uh, what were some of the uh, the doctrines that you you looked at and you thought, how did I ever believe that? Uh, give me a top. Uh, oh, top two. just the just the usual stuff. The Trinity. Mm. Um, you know, th th there was so many um, scriptures that we were trained to use on the ministry to to refute the Trinity. Mm. Um, and yet, if you look at those same scriptures in um, what you'd call a more mainstream Bible, but they don't say the same. They don't say the same thing. Mm. Um, so that was probably the major one. I forget what the others were. Um, to be honest, I mean, I, I always I think remember. about things like, you know, obviously the uh, the time of the end and um, the Armageddon and the Great Tribulation Ugh. and uh, the yeah. New Order and and all that sort yeah. of future stuff is. Um, I mean, I find it fascinating in a way. It's like a science fiction novel, really. It's um, it's kind of wacky but imagine living forever in paradise forever you know never weird, ever actually. dying i mean that would be intolerable doing what mm. nothing you know just worshiping god forever that sounds like torture yeah. to me um and yeah it's funny you, know. you should say that because um do you remember like the live forever book yeah, yeah I do. that was book. the big one yeah well when i was a young pioneer you know that was my go-to book for the ministry and i and i remember it was very very pointed about the whole fact that the end has to be close because people who remembered 1914 are getting yeah. along in years now mm. um, and then of course they they had to flip flop that with the overlapping generations which i never what understood but i just accepted it you know nonsense I mean... and i remember when it was refuted that you know that they again i, I used to think to myself but i used to say to people on the doors yeah. it's soon it's definitely soon look yeah yeah and now uh, that that's that's an apostate book now <laughs> Well, absolutely. I mean, it, yeah, I'd left actually before the overlapping generation um, debacle. Um, I think by the time when I was leaving, they were they were scaling back that the, the generation thing. And in fact, they they removed that little bit from the watchtower that used to say the generation. There used to be a little bit in the watchtower. Um, the, front cover that it would say about the generation that saw 1914 and they slowly started to r stop talking about it and it became obvious because obviously the year 2000 was approaching and, and it just started to get ridiculous you know um, and I, I remember saying the same thing that you just said you know I and I this was one of the things I remember do say um, I do remember saying to the elders look you know you made a liar out of me mm. <laughs> you made a liar out of me I remember standing are on the doors speaking to people um and saying yeah it's definitely going to happen because like you i was somebody that really did toe the line and and i remember yeah. saying to them you know that's exactly what you just said that was the absolute truth um and i remember somebody saying to me once well what, what would you do if it didn't happen you know what would you do if this doesn't happen within this generation and i remember saying oh it definitely will of course yeah. it will i'm not even going to think about that because it's definitely going <laughs> to happen you know <laughs> oh my goodness yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah and i went through the angry phase too um mm. maybe that's worth talking about so many of our listeners will perhaps be also in that phase um I was so angry um, and all that stuff about wasted life and uh, mm. opportunities and everything that that really uh, that was really painful. You, you said very sort of uh, in quite a, a matter of fact way I, I got over that, um, you know, but how did you get over that feeling of anger and frustration and all of that? How did how did you manage to do that, Heather? Um, I think what it was was um, I was so angry that they'd taken um, so much of my life anyway, because I was yeah. in my 40s. Um, but I was just very determined that they weren't going to take any more. And I thought, if I spend okay. the rest of the time feeling angry, yeah. then really they're still in control of my life, you know? Yeah. yeah. So just, I suppose, um, I suppose sheer determination that I was not, I was not going to be angry anymore. 
yeah. and the, a determination to be happy as well that I was mm. going to get the best out of whatever time. Uh, I mean, I'm not that old, but you know, whatever time I've got left, I was determined I wanted to, you know, do what I could with that rather than yeah. sitting around feeling sorry for myself and feeling angry. And also, anger is not good for you health wise anyway. So I knew mm. that wouldn't. And I suppose too, setting a good example for my um, for my children, um, for them not to be angry. I mean, they got out in the in, in the early twenties anyway. So yeah, my daughter is actually still a Jehovah's Witness. Um, so unfortunately, she's not in my life at all, okay. even though I'm not disfellowshipped. Um, so yeah, yeah, determination, I suppose, not to be angry. But it is very easy to be angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's 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 a really interesting. Um, so one of your daughters is 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 shunning you essentially, even though you're not disfellowshipped. Um, yeah, I've got one daughter and three sons. Okay. Right. So my my eldest daughter, she's 31 now. So, yeah. um, but even with that, you know, you you can't be too angry with your children shunning mm. you because I raised her in it. Mm. You know, I've obviously done a good job. She obviously believes it like I did. Mm. So uh, I'm very saddened by it. And it's been six years now. I think I, I think it was 2016 she last spoke to me, except for my dad's funeral, but she didn't really speak to me then anyway. But 2016 was when she started um, cutting me off. Mm. And I mean completely cutting me off, wouldn't respond to any messages. Um, and I think with that, I went through quite a lot of grief, you know, at yeah. loss. yeah. Um, which was why one of the reasons why my paper is called Grieving the Living, because mm. it is you're, mm. you're grieving people as if they're dead, but they're not, they're alive. They're just getting on with their life without you. Um, but again, I'm, I'm over, I'm over the sadness and the anger with that. And I, my only hope now is that she, that she wakes up yeah. and that she um, gets out mm. while she's still, while she's still young. You know? There's nothing you can do about it. No, I, I I guess that the, yeah. Um, was there a? There seems to have been a some sort of hardening within the Jehovah's Witnesses around people that left, that weren't disfellowshipped. I remember when I was growing up and a member, um, if somebody just faded away, you, you didn't. There wasn't a suggestion really that you would shun them. That they, they just yeah. you know you still kind of hope that they'd come back. You'd invite them round maybe when other witnesses were there, and you'd invite them to football or something you know to play football or mm. get and a get together because you wanted to keep in contact with them has something changed there because it seems like that at some point people started yeah, reporting this. 2016 it yeah. was the uh, district convention as far as i remember okay the district convention in um 2016 um, i only know because i was somebody told me um, it's almost as if they gave people a diy disfellowship kit right. and it was um you know, just because somebody is not disfellowshipped um, doesn't mean that you that you don't have to shun them. Basically, if somebody's left the organisation, then it doesn't matter whether they're disfellowshipped or not, then you should have uh, nothing to do with them. Um, and I know this because um, quite a few of my uh, participants for my PhD said the same thing. Right. Um, that it was very much, you know, my mum would have a relationship with me, but then she wouldn't. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it was the district convention 2016 where, where it all changed around. And I think a lot of people got cut off at that point. Right. OK, that that certainly measures up with uh, with what I've heard and, and yeah, even my experience, actually. Um, yeah, that, that seems really self-defeating. I don't understand that, even from the perspective of the witnesses themselves, really. Um, yeah, very, very odd. And I know that you you were estranged from your, your mother as well, which was particularly sad. Um, yeah, she um she wasn't too bad at first, but I could I could sense that she changed with me. Um and then finally she came to the stage uh, probably about three three three, four years ago, where, you know, I'd say, you know, I was gonna come around and see her and she would say, No, I don't want to see you until you come back to Jehovah. And I think that, to some extent, was probably um, stimulated by my brother, who's an elder, <clears throat> who, again, I've not seen for a long time. Right. Um, I think he strongly encouraged her that she shouldn't be having anything to do with me. Um, so she actually died uh, it's almost two years ago of COVID. Oh. Um, and at that time, she'd been shunning me anyway. But I went to see her 
in the hospital because I think at that time if people were dying of COVID then you could you could right. go in and visit okay. and uh, it's one of the things I'll never forget because I was in the full PPE yeah. I've got no idea if she knew it was me mm. and uh, all I could think was if she knew it was me she wouldn't want me here but I thought I can't I can't not say goodbye you know yeah. and very 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 sad that the last few years that you have a relationship with your mum before before passing that is ruined because of this uh, horrible shunning doctrine that they yeah. have yeah. Um, and I know and I know um, that from her perspective it must have been horrible as well I think it's horrible for the shunners and the shunned yeah um, so yeah my mum um, my brother all my nephews and nieces I was very close to a cousin um, who cut me off her, her daughter has since left so we're close again <laughs> um, but yeah you have this mishmash of um, rearrange life don't you of, yeah of people that will stay in your life and people that don't yeah it's it's one of the it's one of the handful of things i would say if if jehovah's witnesses could change their policy on on that that you know you you could say well fine you know uh, everybody can believe what they want to believe it's it's things like that that are the problem so I, i'm very careful yeah you know yeah. if people want to believe that stuff that's absolutely fine in terms of you know the new order and all of the doctrines and all of that that's fine but um but yeah policies like shunning that just brings a really hard edge to the the organization and to people's relationships yeah you can understand why they do it though can't you because oh, yeah. they don't want they don't want people to hear the disconforming um yeah information yeah so they just lock down i think yeah i mean it is a tactic of uh, fear it's a way to keep you in something coercively i mean it's the very dish definition of coercive control you know set up a system where you're not allowed to have friends outside of the organization or you're strongly discouraged from doing that so you don't have an external social life make sure you do that and then threaten people that they'll lose that if they don't carry on coming yeah. I mean that's the it's the oldest trick in the book it's not a clever yeah. psychological tool it is just very very simple um, and that's it's cynical really um yeah so it, well, it's isolation i mean as humans mm, we're social animals aren't we so yeah, to cut yeah. somebody off from their family and their friends is really very cool absolutely yeah so that's um that's particularly sad um, so can i go back to your um let, let's let's um lighten the mood a bit because you you know you you personally have uh, achieved so much in what i th consider is a, is a short period of time actually i i left when i was 30 you know about the same age i'm 55 um i left when i was 30 and it took me uh well i was 50 when i got my first degree so um it took me a long time to get my act together and i've just finished my master's you on the other hand if, uh, you left at but what were you, th sorry, did 48. you say? 48, um, and you're about the same age as me, and you've now done a PhD, so wow, congratulations on that, that Thank is you. like going Thanks. some. Um, Hard work though, I've oh, skipped absolutely. for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so where did you go to uni, what, what uni did you go to? Uh, Edge Hill, so I started on a fast track, um, okay. because I had no A-levels, obviously, because we were allowed to do A-levels. No, that's right. Um, we went straight from uh, school into um, a cleaning job, if I remember rightly, Yeah. as usual. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I left, did a fast-track course, which was three months. So that was a bit of a leap of faith because, well, that's not a leap of faith at all. It's the opposite of a leap of faith. <laughs> um, I, I left my, my job that I had at the time, which was working in Debenhams, um, saved up because this fast-track course that I was on, um, although it was free, um, at the time, I had three children still at home, and I needed to, you know, provide. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd separated from my husband at this point, so I was on my own. So I needed to save up money so that I could um, still live while I was doing this fast track course until my student finance kicked in in September. And of course, I had to pass the fast track course to get onto the the degree. Right. Um. So yeah, I did that did my three-year degree um i actually bypassed my master's in the end i applied for a master's but it kind of okay. turned into a phd right okay um so it was just six straight years of, of study i suppose and then wow. i was very lucky that um i went straight into work as well so i'm a lecturer now at university of Bolton. Oh, wow. um, and i talk about religion um 
not particularly Jehovah's Witnesses, but just coercive control generally yeah. and how um, this, this, this preponderance that people have for believing that their religion is the true religion yeah. and looking down on others, because I'm very much into social identity theory, mm. is, is the reason why there's so much... Um, so many problems with with religion and why you know it causes so many wars etc yeah absolutely so um you you did your your degree and your phd at edge hill um yeah. university and then then you you got this role at, uh, at bolton well that's i mean that's fantastic um what was it like then studying after so many years uh of you know i mean i know for myself it, it's quite a steep learning curve isn't it um how did you find that did you just take to it or was it tough? No, it was really difficult because, you know, at our age anyway, um, you know, we didn't grow up with laptops and no. Microsoft Word, you know, <laughs> and all that. So going to, to uni, um, obviously I had to have a, a laptop, so I had to learn how to use Excel and Word and um, also things like SPSS, you know, yeah. statistics packages. And yeah. I was very lucky that I had um, the little group of little cohort of friends I had at, at uni were, were, were were very supportive and I was kind of like the mum so I'd bring cake <laughs> you know and then um my supervision for my dissertation for my year three dissertation and that same supervisor went on to supervise my PhD right. she was very very supportive I mean she's actually the same very similar age to my daughter hmm. um but you know it's through her that I learned how to to do a lot of things to do with with Microsoft Word but yeah it's a very very steep learning curve hmm. Because, you know, life is very different to how it was when we were at school, isn't it? But you've just got to yeah. get on with it. And, and YouTube's brilliant. You can learn everything off YouTube. <laughs> yeah, there are so, more resources. Yeah. yeah. Um, podcasts, of course, as well. Um, there's lots of stuff you can you, you can learn about. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the academic language, reading papers. I know my master's was mm. much more difficult. Um, essentially, it was just reading papers. And that's... Um, if you've not done that, uh, it's quite, yeah, it's quite hard work, isn't it, to try and understand the language and and obviously then have to write in this academic way. Yeah, of writing. and I think, I think too, and I think this stems back from Jehovah's Witnesses. We were always taught uh, as Jehovah's Witnesses not to be critical, weren't we? We had to accept yes. everything. Yes. And one of the main things in academia is be critical, yeah. question everything. Yeah. Um, and that's been a big learning curve to me to, to to be allowed to just not accept that what i yeah. you know i'm told is is truth that, yeah. that you need to use your your brain you know and if you believe in god you can say your god-given brain um <laughs> to find out these things for yourself yeah but that was difficult that was a that was a learning curve yeah i think um that that's something that yeah i think i i found that quite difficult too and um and yeah uh, was it psychology that you studied was that uh, was yeah. that a psychology degree um i mean there's plenty to be critical about in psychology so that's the good the good news um because there's so many um i mean social psychology particularly is such a new young discipline i think that there's so many theories and ideas that actually lack quite a lot of evidence and um and so there's lots to go at i think to be critical i know i quite enjoyed that once i got into it um mm. and, I, and i also think um that you mentioned about the groups that you get involved in that that was one of the things that i found just so enthralling particularly when i um so i, I was i did the ou uh degree but then i went to Birkbeck for my masters and i found there was a bit more contact there with people and it was just absolutely fantastic you were meeting these people who were just mm -hmm. so bright um you know most of them are half my age but um i just absolutely loved it i i don't know about you but that was such a, a revelation these people that were just so interesting and intelligent and nice you know it's great yeah very much so and especially that last bit that you said there about nice you know as jehovah's yeah. witnesses we were taught to <laughs> yeah. to fear you know to be very suspicious of anyone in the world because they were out to get you and you know, take you away from Jehovah and all this, all this stuff. So to find out that people in the world, you know, are lovely, mostly, yeah, you know, yeah. and there's people in the, you know, in, in what we used to call the truth that uh, turned out to be not so lovely, absolutely. you know, my, absolutely. you know, there's a lot of, you know, bad things that happen in there. Yeah. You know, and, and people would go out of the way to help 
each other um, at their own cost. You know, obviously we're all in the same boat. We're all struggling, trying to get our heads around various different ideas and um, and so on. And yet people would go out of their way to help others. You know, and I thought that was that was great to see. But yeah, um, one of the things that often people on this show when we interview them, that's one of the things they say is that. Um, yeah, we were taught to uh, to be suspicious and fearful of people in the world, but actually, yeah, they'll, they'll just go out of the way. Of course, there are bad people everywhere. As you say, there are bad people at the Kingdom Hall too. So, mm. yeah, that's one of the, the real revelations. I think one thing that was difficult about leaving, thinking back now, is um, like the social aspect. Yeah. Because we were so used to um, only conversing with other Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know what you found your experience was, but when I entered into the world, so to speak, I felt like I was very naive. I didn't know. Um, I felt like I didn't know how to to converse with people properly because mm. you know it didn't follow the rhetoric that I was used to. Um, I didn't know anything about politics. I hardly knew anything about other religions. Yeah. Um, I don't know about yourself, but I found that really quite difficult. This naivety that you have, almost like you're a child in the world. A yeah, lot of catching up to do. I think so. Um, and I, I think I was a bit, <laughs> I went through a bit of a desperate stage <laughs> um, where I think I was a bit too eager to make friends. And people can sense that, you know, you're just kind of mm. um, slightly desperate to build another social life. And um, yeah, nobody wants a desperate bloke hanging around. Um, but, mm. you know, I, I think that's something that I, I, I realized that actually I didn't need to have people surrounding me all the time and be going out all mm. the time. And, you know, I didn't need that. I suppose as you get old, you perhaps need it less anyway. But I I started to realise that I was actually quite self-sufficient. And, yeah, I, I did value the friends I'd made in the world and I still have some close friends. But I didn't um, – I came to realise that, you know, I, I got my own balance, if you like. And I think that's that's yeah. something that people probably feel. Um, I, I know – from from my own little bit of research that that was um you know in my research it was uh going to university it was becoming a stand-up comedian it was um doing homeschooling and then um doing studying that those those were the things that helped people transition it was it was and a big part of that was finding a community finding a group that they could they could go to you know and that really made a big Very difference much so. yeah um right I, I really want to talk about your research heather um, okay um where do we start you've you've uh, you've got two papers out there which and um, I, I must say they're they're really accessible in every way so um one mm. of the frustrations i have with a lot of uh, academia is that you can't read it because it's behind paywalls but your work is is open access so yeah i will put I the links. Sure that. that's fantastic and i'll put the links on on the show notes so everybody can read the papers um yes of course they're academic papers but i still think they're they're quite accessible in terms of being able to to understand and read them the quantitative one obviously there are parts of that that people perhaps won't understand because it's quite statistical but there's mm -hmm. lots of explanations about the conclusions and so on so i really do recommend that people download and read those papers. It's very, very useful, I think. Um, so congratulations on the papers there. They are really interesting. Um, so you've got two papers. Um, one is a qualitative paper. So we've talked about a bit this a bit on the podcast. So qualitative research. Tell us what qualitative research is first, if you don't mind, Heather, so people So this know. is um, IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, which I think you say you use, you use as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this was for my undergraduate dissertation, um, and we decided to ha to try and have that published. I was very lucky that it was it was accepted pretty much the first place I, I you know I sent it, which was good. Yeah, great. Um, so IPA is a method of trying to understand lived experience. Um, it uses hermeneutics, which is this idea of meaning making, and in in IPA, uh, often there's this like what they call a double hermeneutic going on, which you've probably heard of, where the um, person who's doing the interviewing is trying to make sense of the person being interviewed, but the person being interviewed is also trying to make sense of their own experience. So you've got like this this double hermeneutic going on, um, and I think um, because it is 
such a strange phenomenon um, that of all the different qualitative methods, um, I thought that was the most appropriate. Um, obviously, there's lots of different qualitative methods, but IPA is definitely my favourite. Yeah, it's um, so for for listeners who who perhaps um, don't even know what qualitative means. It's as opposed to a piece of research that's using sort of statistics or an experiment or something like that. This is this is research that is essentially listening to people's stories, generally speaking, mm. qualitative stuff, and it's a way to um, to get deeper into those people's lives and their experiences so you're not looking at huge numbers of participants like you would in a um, a quantitative study this is a few people a handful of people generally where you're really taking a deep dive into their own experience and IPA is a is a specific type of that sort of qualitative um, work I think the other thing about IPA which I found useful I guess you found the same is that because of our experience as Jehovah's Witnesses um, sometimes the accusation can be well you know because of your own experience you, you're not objective really you can't do this research in an objective way and IPA is a great method because that says that's not a problem <laughs> because who can be objective anyway when you're having these types of in-depth conversations with people you're always going to come from some perspective aren't you um and yeah and the other thing is sorry go on no no please i'm, I'm talking too much i was just going to say from like from an ethics point of view um when you're doing any any research in the public domain it has to go through an yeah. ethics committee yeah. so if, you, if, if you're doing an ipa study it's it's things like making sure that the questions are open-ended and not leading yeah so, you know, the ethical standards behind IPA um, are, are, are robust. Um, and yes, there are, you know, it is all down to interpretation and maybe an ex Jehovah's Witness would interpret it in a biased way. But that's that's the good thing about being part of a research study. So it wasn't yeah. just me. Yeah. Um, my supervisors also had access to the transcripts. And so, you know, sometimes things did need tweaking a little bit. Mm. Um, and there's that constant reminder. It's called reflexivity, isn't it, where... You've got to be aware of your own stance. You've got to try and remain objective as much as you can and not detach yourself from the research, but just try to re retain that idea of looking at it as objectively as you can, even though in a lot of cases, you know, the, the, the interviews were really quite emotional. We had mm. tears and, you know, people's telling me their stories. And it was yeah. really, you know, very sad stories of suicide and... Um, yeah, pretty bad. But IPA is perfect for that because it does yeah. look at this this phenomenon in a, in in like a meaning making way. Yeah, I was going to say this um, sense making is is a big part of qualitative work and and particularly IPA. Um, so you're trying to understand how people make sense of their experience after they've had it essentially so they're, they're looking back at their experience yeah. and making sense of that. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about your participants? You had six uh participants um and again I, I was just i read it again this morning um and yeah it's some of it is heart-wrenching actually um but really good you know it's it's a really interesting piece so who are your participants um for the first study and hmm. um, the grieving the living ones um it was a bit of a, a mixture of people that have been disfellowshipped and people that hadn't and it was also a mixture of people that i knew um, and also people that I'd met on Facebook groups. So obviously when you're doing a study, yeah. you have to do it properly. So I had to have an information and consent sheet. And I just asked for participants. Overwhelming amount of people, um, you know, wanted to participate. Well, yeah. um, so I think, I think there was only six, um, mm. whereas in my PhD there was 26. So big difference with that. But this well, was just an undergraduate study. Yeah. And IPA is actually a, a, a fine number. Six is fine for yeah, IPA anyway. Yeah. So yeah, a couple a couple were um, disfellowshipped. Um, I'm trying to think now. That's so because had, I was looking at. Yeah. So you had um, John. Um, obviously, these are yes. uh, 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 anonymized so names. Yes. Yeah, so he had uh, left the Jehovah's Witnesses voluntarily. Um, yeah, so he was quite. I, I interviewed him for my PhD as well. He was quite graphic in some of the phrases that he used, 
about being a Jehovah's Witness, um, which was reiterated by a lot, you know, about expressions like it's like being chained to the wall and told to behave. And, you know, he talked about this idea of being almost like in a cage as a Jehovah's Witness uh, yeah. adolescent, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so that was him, yeah. Yeah, that uh, one of the things that I... Um... I absolutely love doing this job um, and obviously uh, you see it in your work is the way that people are so creative with their metaphors around. Oh, it's the... incredible. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And in my PhD, the metaphors were amazing as well. You know, there was yeah. one, one who, who um, one young man who referred to himself as a, as a caged demon, you know, with, with his wings wow. clipped, you know, wow. and like, um, in fact, one of the themes in my, in my PhD in, in that particular chapter was freeing the demon. He said it was like, you know, once he got disfellowshipped, it was like he'd been, he's, he'd been let out of this page, um, cage, but because of his perception of being disfellowshipped made him bad in his own eyes, then he was portraying himself as, as a demon. It's really, it's, it's incredible. Wow. The, mm. the metaphors that, that people use. Yeah. I, that, that for me demonstrates the work that's going on with the person you know they're working hard we work we were working hard we are still working hard to try and make sense of what happened to us and and using stories and metaphors is the way we do that it's it's so human isn't it it's, it's the psychology of that is really interesting i think that's how we make sense of those when we look back on it actually quite odd experiences um you've got sue 51 year old white female uh, oh yeah, she was disfellowshipped. Yes. She was disfellowshipped. I think um, her and, and another participant um, had a very, very tough time because I remember with Sue, she, um, like myself, had, had been a pioneer um, all her life, regular pioneer, and um, she she married somebody who was a Jehovah's Witness. I think he was an ex-Bethelite actually, but because his marriage wasn't as the society view it. Um, he wasn't free to marry from there. He was really, he was divorced, but yes. from their perspective, he wasn't free to marry. Mm. And she was, uh, she was disfellowshipped. She tried to take her life a couple of times. She obviously had um, a severe mental breakdown. Um, and unfortunately, because she was still in the position where she believed the doctrine. Um, we talked before about the importance of unpicking that doctrine. She, she didn't do that for a long time. So she was in a bad way for, for quite a long time. I mean, when I interviewed her, I think she'd been out about 25 years. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing about her, I mean, in real life, she, she'd been my friend from, we pioneered together when we were like 19. Oh, wow. Uh, and she'd seen me on um, an ex-JW Facebook group and contacted me and said, I can't believe it's you. Is it really you? Because we'd not seen each other for so, so long. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Yeah, so I interviewed her. Wow. How amazing, fun. isn't it? That's amazing. Uh, and then this, this other one, which I thought was really interesting, Jo. Um, she's a 72-year-old uh, white female converted at the age of 27. So she wasn't born in. She was converted. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's, she's been left 24 years. Yeah, um, she was a doorstep convert. She, she was an ex-Catholic. Right. And she she came into the religion because she wanted um, a future for her children, right? Um, which kind of backfired on her a little bit because when she realised that uh, she, she she got baptised quickly because Armageddon was coming in 1975. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought she was her and her children. She thought she'd secured a place in paradise. Right. Um, but unfortunately, um, after she realised it wasn't the truth. Um, her son stayed in it, and her son's an elder, and I think he's been shunning her for for oh, a long time, yeah. long, long time. So she's she she's what I'd 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 fall into the category of still very angry. Yeah. But it was clear with her and um, another participant. I'm forgetting her. I'm forgetting it. Was there one called Sonia? There's one called Sophie. Sophie, that's it. Yeah. Her and Sophie, they've converted to the religion, and it was quite clear, from my perspective, anyway that they had this ability to kind of revert yeah. to a non-JW identity, their pre-JW identity, because they've been brought up without that indoctrination. 
Yeah. Whereas those who were born in didn't have that ability to switch back because there was nothing to switch back to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of the the big uh, the big themes of this podcast that um, I certainly talk about a lot, and it's one of the things that I talk about in in my paper and I've written stuff on Medium about it. Um, and it right, I want to get your opinion about this, Heather, because um, mm -hmm. it's something that I've been kind of getting quite exercised about. So there's lots of um, people that I really admire who talk about cults, high control groups and so on. We've had some of the, those people on the show. I absolutely love their work. Um, but a lot of the books, a lot of the, certainly historically anyway, and a lot of the work that is done around cults, um, there's this, and I think it comes from therapy a lot. So a lot of, a lot of the people that are talking about this are, are therapists by trade, if you like. Um, and there's this narrative that says like like we've sort of alluded to actually what's happened is that the cult has imposed a cult self over the top or a cult identity over the top if you like or it's replaced your own self your authentic self and so when you leave the cult the the battle is then to re-find this authentic self mm. and i I understand how that is a useful metaphor for somebody who, yes, like you described, came in in their 20s and was already a fully formed individual and then they were converted and then they can go back to something. I mean, it'll be slightly different, but they can at least have a mm -hmm. reference point. But I I actually, not it's not only not useful for somebody like me or you who was brought up in it, I think there's actually, it's, it's slightly dangerous and, and because... If you're not careful what you can be saying what it sounds like to me as somebody who was raised as a jehovah's witness is i don't have an identity and i've got to build it from scratch and uh, that was one of my problems when i left and it was before i started studying psychology but it suddenly occurred to me that my problem was i struggled with my identity you know who am i and if you're reading experts about cults essentially telling you that you don't really have one i think that mm. puts a huge psychological hurdle in the way and what so i'm going to stop talking now i'd like your thoughts on that um and i'm not dissing some of the brilliant people that have done this work but yeah. i worry about that um two things so first of all i mean i've i've heard this idea of um um, your cult personality almost being like an overlay over yeah. your own personality. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think I agree with that very mm. much. I wouldn't say completely disagree with it. But um, from it wasn't that clear with my undergraduate stuff, but certainly with my postgraduate stuff and, and stuff that I'm hoping to get published in, within the next few months, one of my chapters was on identity. And I did find that people who've been raised in, in, in the religion um, they didn't have an identity, you know, they would say things like, who was I? I, I? I didn't know who I was. I didn't have an identity outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I didn't have an identity. And I think what it is, is um, rather than it being an overlay, I think, I think it, when you're brought up in it, your identity is so interwoven with the religion mm -hmm. that the two are inseparable. And this is why I did a separate um, this is again for my PhD, why I did a separate chapter on social identity and personal identity, mm. because although they are interwoven, I think they very much are separate as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that being raised a Jehovah's Witnesses, a Jehovah's Witness, um, you you have a Jehovah's Witness identity, and outside of that, very little remains because of the fact that, that that's it's almost like the soil that you grew up in. Yeah, and and that's. That and I do think a, it's dangerous. That I is do a think problem, it, I agree isn't it? with you. <laughs> yeah, I do I agree with you. It's very dangerous. And that's why people go on a quest yeah. to find out who they are. Mm. They may try loads of different religions. They may become um, a little bit engaged in risky behavior because they don't know what to do with themselves. Mm. Um, there's all sorts of things. And I suppose I was quite lucky there, A, because I left of my own accord and sought an identity through higher education, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah. It's... So so what his his um so the the my study was a very small study. It was only three participants. So obviously we we cannot draw conclusions about this. But obviously I've talked to lots of people on this show, 
um, as mm. well. And and even the way that that you were talking about your yourself. Um, so what my my proposal, if you like, is what's happening. I think if you successfully nav navigate this, what what people might be doing is um, creating a a, con a coherent narrative. And that's actually what what we need to be able to do. So if I say that Jehovah's Witness Steve, he's gone, you know, dead, and I've got to build something from scratch, I think that is almost mm. impossible. And so I, I chose not to kill off old Steve, because actually a lot of old Steve is, is the same. You know, I used to like playing sports. I used to be very sensitive and you know worried a lot um these are still things that i'm absolutely like now and the yeah part um, of your identity it is it's still who i am participants um i spoke to you know one of them was a he was an elder he used to love giving talks and he was all i, I grew up with him so i knew him myself and um he was always known as as funny you know he's always a hilarious guy he and he talks great he'd tell funny stories and everybody would laugh and and everything and then he became a stand-up comic when he left and he in his mm -hmm. story he's able to say you know i was always doing it it was always the same i always wanted to entertain and then i became a stand-up comedian because that was who i was so in a way it feels like the successful transition is when you can say yeah okay I'm different in a lot of ways, and and this was reflected in the the participants who would on the literally in the same sentence say, "I'm completely different." You know, you wouldn't recognise me. I'm completely different, and yeah. then go on to explain how how they were always studious. They were always interested in yeah, digging which is what into I did. things, which is exactly what you did. And so I feel like actually what what we're doing is we're we're creating this narrative, and that's actually what we should be encouraging people to do, not not to kill off the old person because you we can't. It, that's already done. You know, we our formative years were spent um mm. doing all those silly things like knocking on doors i mean i traipse around peterborough where i live um still live all all over the place and you know that was me um i i you know so i'm not gonna completely abandon that person so that's the way i um i wonder if there's some some mileage there you know to say actually that's what people yeah. are doing. i mean one of the things i looked at for my phd was this idea of role identity uh, Stryker yeah. and Berg did a paper in 2000 mm. on how the, you know, the most prominent or salient roles that we hold, they're the ones that kind of dictate our identity. Mm. Um, and in my PhD, one of one of my participants had this idea that in, in the quest of searching for, it was him who, who coined the expression that he had a cookie cut personality. Mm. Um, mm. But he, he went on this quest to purge the JW identity. So all the all the stuff that he wasn't allowed to do while he was a Jehovah's Witness, he engaged in that. Yeah. After he left, even like trying religions that are like Satanism and stuff. Yeah. Um. So I think that is part of this quest, and I think you are right that underneath it all, um, we we do have our core self, and it's almost as if it's been forced into this JW mold, and it's hard when you've left the religion to kind of strip that back mm -hmm. and find out. Um, who you are but I did have and maybe it varies in between participants because I did have some participants that said aside from their JW identity they did they did not know who they are mm. or, or who they were yeah so perhaps yeah. it's a perhaps it's a little bit dependent on personality types as well I think there's like a lot there. Yeah, individual differences I think uh, we, we talk about that loads on, you know we keep coming back to that because it is so it is such a kind of um an unknown variable in a lot of a lot of the research you know you people mm. are so different the way they respond to it but I, I i do think i mean i've said it myself you know i didn't know who i was it was it was something i would say regularly um so i think it's absolutely there's lots of evidence that people have these identity crises or an identity crisis um Definitely. It, just, it just feels to me that it's um part of the success su successful way out of that is is to not not try to destroy the old person actually but to integrate what you actually Definitely, quite liked about yeah. the person you know and and um and, and sort of build because we're, we're all changing all the time you know identity isn't a fixed thing anyway um mm -hmm. and it seems to me that that's that 
that would be a better way of framing it than um, the cult personality that was that and this is now something completely different um, but anyway that's that's and know, I think as you've so already said it does depend on whether you're raised in it or not if yes. you know I've definitely found that you know in, in my PhD studies as well that people who were not raised in the religion I wouldn't say they have it easy because nobody has it easy but they do seem to have this ability mm. to yeah. go back to where they were and another interesting thing i found was that people who were raised in the religion that um, left they got their family back yes because obviously yes. they came into the religion um, yeah. and left their family yeah. but people who leave the religion and they were born into it they lose their families so you've got this this extreme of people who, who are getting their families back and people who are completely losing them so i think being raised yeah. In the religion makes a, a huge huge difference it's almost like they're completely different cases it's almost i wonder whether we should almost categorize these as, as completely different experiences um again this is just me thinking about this but it feels to me like can we obviously that it's a venn diagram with some in the middle but it feels to me like the experience is so different when you are raised in the oh the definitely it's almost like a and this completely is one different the, thing yeah and this is one of the things i want to have a look at um mm. in, in in further in further work because i do believe that the things that jehovah's witness children like yourself and, and myself and my children were exposed to the graphic violent imagery mm. in the books oh. um, that we grew up, yeah. up on you know my my book of horror stories as i call it now yes. um <laughs> That is bound to have an influence on people's identity and their ability to transition their identity out of it. Yeah. Because yeah. this has been imprinted on you mm. um, from, from childhood. Mm. Um, and that is something that, that I do want to look at, this idea of, um, of imprinting. And I remember when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I used to have these vivid dreams about, I don't know if you did, I've, I've spoken to a few ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, vivid dreams about Armageddon. I used to call them my Armageddon dreams and it would always be the same thing and I would always die. And it was always not Armageddon. It was the great tribulation, which, yeah. you know, we were told was the lead up to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, uh, part of this whole idea of what Jehovah's Witness children are exposed to, um, which terrible. I, to be honest, I, I, I view it as religious um, instead of, you know, childhood sexual abuse. I think it's childhood it's abuse. religious abuse. I feel it is. Um, I was terrified of persecution. You know, that was, we, we were told that, again, this was sort of great tribulation stuff that, that um, all the religions would, would be destroyed because um, the governments would turn on false religion first. And then the only religion that would be left, I mean, how ridiculous is this, would be Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, and then yeah. there would be persecution. And I would, as a child, I would think to myself, how am I going to withstand persecution? And I think about all the different ways that, and this is as a child, that they might torture me um, to get me to give up where the brothers might be, you know, if they were hiding. Because you'd hear all these experiences of brothers in different countries where they were in hiding and, you know, they would have to um, withstand being beaten and stuff like that, mm. not giving away where they were. And it was all yeah. absolutely terrifying um yeah sounds was, like we were both was, raised on the same thing i think we were and uh, do you remember the um well we used to call it the paradise book do you remember that this the is pink going one. back yeah it's going back yeah i've still got mine actually really so that was the f first book that i remember being frightened by some of the pictures so there's a picture there of uh, a baby being offered as a sacrifice um to the molek molek that's it yeah mm. and I, I couldn't stop looking at that picture and it was it was really disturbing I mean, it was very, it was only a very simple picture, but as a child, I would look at that picture and I would just be really terrified about that. Um, and actually, if you look through that book, I did it as a bit of a, an exercise of the day and, and counted how many times the pictures were of people being killed. Um, mm. It's quite, it's quite surprising. At least half of the pictures were of people being killed. Um, yeah. And that's a book, book for children. That's a book for children. <laughs> Yeah, and then, you know, it's terrifying. funny, you, you know, I've just picked up on something you said before that you said that you would um, you would stare at that. Now, I yeah. used to do that as well. I would yeah. just stare at these pictures yeah. for ages. And I think it's because mm. it was so graphic and disturbing for a child. 
you get mesmerized by stuff yeah. like that and yeah. it's really quite damaging i think it is it absolutely is yeah um so that, anyway that that's uh, qualitative work it's called i love the title by the way um uh, grieving the living uh i've closed it now let me uh, open it again maybe you can remind me what it's called grieving the living i can't remember let me look i've got two papers with such similar titles one's life after social death and one's grieving the living yeah um grieving the living the social death of former jehovah's witnesses oh that's um, right social death yeah so that's um and the reason i called it that great. was because there's um there's a scholar called uh, kipling williams who's done an awful lot of work on ostracism don't know if you've yeah. read any of his work but mm. he talks a lot about this idea of social death right um so it kind of tied in and, and the expression grieving the living was an expression that one of my participants used because that's exactly what it is it's um, yeah it, it's similar to there's this work by um Another, the, another scholar called Testoni in Italy, and she writes about people who are grieving lost relatives who have just gone missing. Right. And it's a similar feeling that, you mm. know, you don't know whether somebody's alive or dead because they're just not in your life anymore, but there's, yeah. there's actually no closure. And I think it's the same with us. Yeah. When we, when we leave that religion, we, we never have any closure. Um, because we're always wondering, I'm always wondering what my daughter's doing, what my cousin's doing, what my brother's doing. Yeah. And you're just in this state of, of not knowing what's going on with people that you want to be really close to and have been really close yeah. to, but they've been torn away from you. It's like, this is might be inappropriate, but it's, it's like living in a zombie movie. Um, yeah, it is. Because the, the, you, the people that you knew, um, they are still there, but they're not quite there. You know, they don't talk to you anymore. They, you can see them walking around, but, they don't have any interaction with you they're not quite the same um mm. yeah it's yeah. um it's terrible um and and your other paper so maybe we can talk about this for a few minutes um okay that's this life is, after social death that's it leaving the jehovah's that's witnesses cool. identity transition and recovery this was the first study of my phd right so um yeah so that we, we got this published quite early on in the phd because what we wanted to do was set the scene with the quantitative work I, initially, I wanted my PhD to be fully qualitative, but right. um, my supervisor, my professor, um, or one of my supervisors, should I say, wanted to make the PhD more robust by adding a quantitative element. So yeah. I advertised on Facebook and Reddit. And in the end, I think I got about 900 participants. Very fantastic. good. Yeah, fantastic. Um, that's often it was one whittled of down to about, yeah, it was whittled down to about 544 because... Yeah. Everyone, anyone that didn't fill in the in the application, the sorry, the questionnaire, completely, we had to discard those. Right. But we had some very interesting findings from that, which yeah. need to be um, re-looked at, and there's different reasons why this may be the case. So first of all, we hypothesised that being disfellowshipped would elicit higher levels of perceived ostracism. Yeah. But we actually found the opposite which was yeah. really weird. That is odd, isn't it? Yeah, but thinking about it, I'm wondering, we're not talking here about mental health, we're talking about perceived ostracism. Mm. So the only thing I could think of was the fact that if somebody is disfellowshipped, then they are expecting ostracism. Yeah. Whereas if somebody leaves of their own free will and they still get ostracised, then that sense of agency is maybe more, maybe more powerful and perhaps there's a sense of injustice being felt there, mm. you know, because they haven't done anything to warrant being ostracized and yet they're being ostracized just the same. Or it could be the fact that the scale that we use, because we used a workplace ostracism scale, it could be that the scale didn't capture properly yeah. the essence of what that was like. So what I want to do in future research is instead of using a workplace ostracism scale, I want to devise my own religious ostracism scale right and test that out because that can be more that can be more adapted to the specific experiences so for example some people were asked you know about about ostracism and did they get shunned and they answered no but then i'd have a few emails from people that said that your scale according to your scale i had to say no but really the reason i don't get ostracized is because i've moved away so i don't right. see any of them yes so yeah, i think yeah. the 
the questionnaire needs to be reworded in such a way that it can capture it properly. It's so hard with this sort of work. The confounding variables um, are yes. legion, aren't they? It's yes. really, really hard. Um, one of the things that I was going to ask you about it was, did you... Um, so when, when somebody is disassociated, that, that can be for a number of different reasons. So sometimes they disassociate themselves. So they, it's uh, this... Um, agencies I'm no longer coming anymore I'm writing a letter I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore but then other times if somebody say joins another church or um, joins the army or something then they get disassociated they yeah so, I think it's you... quite a new yeah it's quite a new thought that in the Jehovah's Witnesses mm. in the past you had to disassociate but now they call it that you've dissociate, disassociated yourself by your conduct that's right yeah so that is um, another my potential... scale did, yeah my scale didn't really account for disassociation we were just looking at um disfellowshipped and not disfellowshipped really right. okay and um, so again that needs to be re-looked into uh, and your second hypothesis was that um heightened religious commitment during the membership during being a Je jehovah's witness would be associated with more difficulty in establishing a post-religious sense of self um, yes, so that's, that's right. really interesting. So, do you want to tell us? Yeah, what we you found, found with that? that. Yeah, we found that um, respondent levels of commitment were associated with increased ostracism post exit, but more success at identity transition. So, again, that's really interesting, isn't it? So, yeah. pe people that were more committed had a better outcome when it came to self identity, to so building this yeah. self. Um, any, yeah, any but thoughts we're ostracized about why more. Might, but we're ostracized more any thoughts about why well i've got my own personal thoughts so my personal thoughts are and this is um to do with myself as well um, when i left the jehovah's witnesses because my identity was very much aligned with the jehovah's witnesses but when i left um i did a lot of research and then it, it was like a pendulum it went exactly the other way so i wonder if um it, it might be a, a case of personality and being com more committed per se, that that's yeah. your, yeah. that you're either fully in it or you're fully out of it. Mm. Whereas if you're in the middle and you're a bit, you know, not sure. Yeah. Um, and again, I looked into that with the qualitative research because I wanted to know um, what was going on. And in terms of like increased ostracism, it could be that um, those that are committed to the, to the organization are more likely to be obedient in terms of their associations. And so they would have less um, friendships outside. So they may feel ostracism more because they've yeah. got nobody. Yeah. Whereas some people, I don't know if you remember from growing up, but when I was growing up a Jehovah's Witness and when I was in it as well, there was always people in the, in the congregation that had friends on the outside anyway. Yeah. So it could be this idea of, people that are more committed maybe had more to lose in their, in socially and and i guess it, another another possible element is what we were talking about before in that um as an individual you're um you're also withdrawing yourself you're 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 isolating yourself to a degree um if you you know if you were very committed because i was like you i was very committed and then when i left i i didn't want to end up being disfellowshipped so i withdrew uh, to mm -hmm. some degree myself so i was ostracizing myself as well as um it happening to me so there could be an element of that as well i guess that's that's really interesting i, I had the same thought with the person personality traits um as well that you know if you're a very committed person then you're likely to you know become a very committed non-jehovah's witness as well i, I think yeah i think i've gone yeah. from like pioneer to queen of the apostates almost <laughs> exactly. and the the third <laughs> hypothesis uh was that uh identification with social support groups would be associated with progress regarding identity yeah. reformation so i think that one was not surprising um yeah tell us what you found on that one well the same thing that um that you know association with 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 um positive groups could predict i suppose post-exit functioning in, yeah. in a social way um and it was interesting with this that i found that people who were disfellowship were less likely to initially get involved with xjw groups and i think that was because of the perception of apostasy mm. whereas people who left through choice they had their own agency they needed support and so they were more likely to 
to go to these XJW groups for support. So I do think there was a very strong uh, feeling there of this idea of, of getting involved in groups that is, is more likely to be experienced by somebody who's been disfellowshipped. Because if you think about it, somebody who's been disfellowshipped, they clearly still believe the doctrine. Because if they didn't believe the doctrine, why would they put themselves through a judicial yeah. committee? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's very good. So point. if so, if they've been disfellowshipped, I think they're less likely to turn to XJW Facebook groups or Reddit groups for for help because they've got this whole self perception of being evil. I suppose. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm a bad yeah. person. I've been I've been thrown out, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, they, they call this um, physically in, mentally out, or physically out, mentally in, sorry. Um, Homie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I looked at all that in my PhD, actually. It's interesting. Those different it? acronyms. Very interesting how um, uh, ex-witnesses have created this language around leaving and, um, you know, again, this is part of the making sense, the sense-making process, I think. Um well, I mean, we could just talk about this forever, couldn't we? Uh, it's so interesting. I mean, the, the whole a ecosystem of ex Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, is fascinating too. Um, oh, it is. You know how how that works. And when I left, there was nothing. You know, in terms of well, the, perhaps there was a few discussion groups you could join in, but now it's a, a really interesting group, um, which still has an identification with a with a religion that they no longer believe in which i think is really interesting mm. and i think that is a, you know we're quite lucky these days because one of my participants who was disfellowshipped probably 30 years ago now she said that when she left or when she was disfellowshipped there was nothing that's right so you know at least with people who leave these days a quick internet search and you'll find so much support yeah absolutely yeah it's very very different now um, so what, what's your, you've already talked about some, some more research. So clearly you're, you're at the beginning of, of this, this career in, in doing this research. What, what's, uh, what's your thoughts for the future? What are you, what are you planning? Um, well, the, the quant paper, as we've just talked about, is already um, published. But I've got three other papers from my PhD that I'm hoping to get published at some point this year. Um, so one of them is on identity, which we've already talked about. Yeah. Uh, one of them is on social identity, but the middle uh, paper was on um, mental health um, and, and the problems that people have with with, the, with their mental health because of um, being disfellowshipped and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, so in that one, um, I found that people who were disfellowshipped were much more likely to have problems with their mental health because of these negative self perceptions there was much more likelihood of suicidal ideation actual mm -hmm. suicide yeah. uh, risky behavior um and other other people who said that they um were treated as if they were dead this idea of of, of grieving the living um losing their family relationships um and also this idea as we already mentioned about the death row mentality um if if you're Un, um, unlikely to engage in research then it's very likely that you're gonna you're gonna stay um homey is it physically out mentally in yeah. which i think is is pretty dangerous it's an awful because place you've to got be. this mm -hmm. yeah yeah and in that chapter that you know i i came across a lot of um abuse stories of abuse i, I was absolutely shocked because this wasn't part of my PhD. My PhD was identity. And yet I came across a lot of domestic violence, a lot of childhood sexual abuse, um, a lot of people saying that um, rather than, you know, taking this up with the legal system, that they were to leave it in Jehovah's hands, all this kind of stuff, which is very interesting because there's a book just been released. I think we mentioned this the other day. I think it's called, is it called uh, Responses to law and minority religions i think okay. it's called that um and one of the chapters in there is written by um i think he is an academic um tony tony brace um and he talks in there of, of of using the law to try to put things right that jehovah's witnesses are being accused of such as like blood um blood transfusions or persecution 
um, or, you know, taking ex-Jehovah's Witness activists to court. Mm. And this kind of got my back up a little bit because in my research, I found that people said that when they experienced domestic violence or childhood sexual abuse, they were encouraged to leave it in Jehovah's hands and not mm. take their brother to court. Mm. And yet, on the other hand, you've got the organisation, clearly very active, very litigious. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's something else that perhaps is worth looking at. So, yeah, I've got those three papers to look at. Um, just about to start a collaboration with um, academics from Edgehill University and Aston University. Um, and we're going to look at different things. Um, we're hoping to get funding from that so that'll be a massive project if we get funding it'll be brilliant fantastic i think that's going through um an organization a charity called inform if you've heard of that i've heard of that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it um it, it funds research into uh, minority religions so you know fingers crossed we might get uh, funding for that and then we can look at these different things mm. um through for example, the LGBTQ plus community. Yep. So that came up a lot in my research as well. Yeah, yeah. People, you know, attempting or seriously considering suicide because mm. they knew that their homosexual identity was not congruent with their JW yeah. identity. Yeah. Um, so there was quite a lot of that as well. So we'd like to explore that further. Um, but that will be a big, um, that will be a, um, one of the things in, in one of the papers that I talk about. That I'm hoping to get. That sounds really soon. interesting and really important. Um, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for telling us all about that and obviously your own story, Heather. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you, just like I knew it would be. Um, <laughs> we had some technical issues at the start, which our listeners will not know about. Um, so we, uh, we we managed to to get there in the end. But um, so thank you for persevering that was so interesting thank you very much um heather ransom thank you can i just say thank you for this work that you're doing as well it can't be well, you know you. that easy doing these podcasts all the time and i find them fascinating to listen to you know oh, i listen to them in the car on the way to work so brilliant yeah so well, thank you for your work as well oh well, you're absolutely welcome we love doing it i mean i i particularly love doing it. Uh, it if i could do it as my job i would but unfortunately it doesn't pay um but um it's it's great so interesting to talk to people um so many interesting stories um and it's brilliant to have people like yourself doing that academic work that, that i think matters so much um i don't know whether you're familiar with the um international cultic studies association oh um, ICSA, yeah 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 um so i'm doing a, a presentation for the the next um uh, conference that's coming up in june oh um, it would be nice like though. to see that yeah well um it's all online stuff so um yeah it's, it's available but um i'm happy yeah. to get involved in that I myself say, but with I my think phd i've not a chance mm. maybe next year i think you know your your work there would be absolutely right up that that street really so um yeah you definitely should it's definitely your sort of thing mm. thank you so much thank you what Should I Think About is an Evil Sheep production. 